Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so we're in this series called International Harvester, as you can see. And um, in this series, what we've been talking about is how how Jesus, as we already kind of spoke about, um, he is he's reaping a harvest all over the world, internationally. Right now, even in times like these, 2020, the most dire seeming that maybe in, in your lifetime, certainly probably in my lifetime, it's like, man, just I've never experienced a, a, a culture and society and civilization functioning the way they're functioning right now. And yet, still, Jesus is at work reaching people all over the globe. Not just right here in Maryland, but all over the globe. And so where we want to be found is partnering with the International Harvester. So week one, we looked at how this was true even with the disciples when uh, they rolled through this place called Samaria. And um, Jesus met this woman at the well, and uh, they were tasked to bring food uh, back. And uh, what ends up happening is Jesus has a conversation with this woman, and in fact, then she goes back to the town and brings back people. The, the disciples brought back food. She brought back people. And Jesus was there saying, I have other bread than just normal bread to eat. This is the harvest that has come. And so we want to be found like the woman. We want to be found like the Samaritan woman, not the disciples, the ones who should have been the example. We want to be like the Samaritan woman, the one who's bringing the harvest, partnering with Jesus. And it's expect the unexpected was the point there. Expect the unexpected because Jesus was the unexpected Messiah. The reason everyone was struggling is because they didn't expect, right? So they were blinded to what Jesus actually was. They had an expectation of the Messiah that blinded them from the true Messiah. And so what we looked at is, listen, expect the unexpected. When the unexpected begins to happen, expect the unexpected one to show up and do something unexpected. That was a lot of things, but I think that made sense, right? And then uh, week two, we looked at how Jesus brings meaning out of mundane things. We looked at the wedding in Cana and, and, and how these people, they just filled up water jugs. Mother Mary, right, she says, she says, listen, whatever, whatever Jesus says, you do that. She says, in the sermon right there, just whatever Jesus says, do that. That's a great advice. Right? But what Jesus tells them to do, they need wine for the party so the shame will not be brought upon everyone at the party to include Jesus and his mother. And so what Jesus says is go fill up some water jugs with water. It's like, no, what? We need wine, not water. This mundane task is given, they do it, and meaning is brought into that. We talked about how in our lives it's the mundane things that Jesus brings meaning, right? And then last week we looked at how Jesus will multiply the mediocre. Multiply the mediocre. We looked at how um, the the parable, the twin parables of, of the mustard seed and the leaven and how the mustard seed is this tiny thing, but yet it grows to be the largest of all the garden plants. This tiny thing when planted becomes the largest, Right? He multiplies these small little things. And then the leaven, the small little little leaven, will go into 50 to 60 pounds of bread. And, and when the work is done, leaven is in the whole thing. See, it's the small things and the unseen things. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, God will multiply those things. And we use the analogy of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and the, the, the eagle and the child pub. And how in the 1930s that would have just been a normal conversation, a normal thing going on. But what they were discussing were two books that have affected, two series of books that have affected generations and generations of people for the gospel of Jesus and to communicate the character of God. And if you would have been there in the 1930s, it would have just been a normal day, normal joy, normal guys having a normal conversation. But God takes what seems to be no mediocre or so-so or, or just original. And he multiplies it and brings about an impact that you can't imagine. So don't underestimate the mundane things, the mediocre things. Have an expectation for the unexpected. So today we're going to talk about he magnifies the minute. Jesus magnifies the minute. So let's look at this. Uh, if you have a Bible... Uh, open it up to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And so what we're going to look at is Josh already pointed us to 
is, is um, this teaching that Jesus gives. And he, he gives the example of what is happening right there in front of him. What is happening right there in front of him. And so Mark chapter 12, we're going to, be in, we're going to start verse 38. Um, and what Jesus does here is he uh, teaches. And whether Jesus teaches these two back to back or Mark and Luke, both authors put these two, these two teachings side by side for an intention. Uh, very, very intentional because what he's trying to do is contrast the scribes with the widow. He's, he's, he's painting a very clear picture of the scribes and the widow. What we see throughout both of the Gospels of Luke and Mark is that consistently what you have is you have the religious elites rejecting the Messiah and you have the poor, outcast, downtrodden receiving the Messiah. This is really interesting thing. Expect the unexpected, right? It's not who you would expect. Okay, if you're there, say word. Uh, let's get into God's word, so God's word can get into us. Amen. He also said in his teaching, "Be aware of the scribes who want to go around in long robes, who want greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets." Listen to these words. They devour widows' houses and say long prayers just for show. These will receive harsher judgment. Then he goes to this in verse 41. Sitting across from the temple treasury, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Then the poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little, summoning his disciples. He said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. For they gave out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, and has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, speak to us. Help us understand what your word is communicating to us, what your spirit was communicating to Mark, and what Mark was trying to tell us about who you are, what your character is like, and what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God, partnering with the international harvest. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to give you a little context. Uh, real quick, um, I like to draw on the board. I'm going to use my sleeve. Sorry. All those who are like, no, don't do that. I got to. Okay. So I want to show you real fast what Mark is doing here. So in the Gospel of Mark, so we have Mark. So I'm going to teach for just a minute. Then I'll get to preaching. Are you good with that? So you have this huge section, how, how Mark frames his book, okay? And then you have this small, narrow section in the middle, and then you have another large section here. Okay? So chapters chapters uh, 1 through 8, we'll say 8B. What happened? Oh, we got to make more markers. Look at you. Amen. A wife is a good thing. A man who finds a good wife is it's a great thing. Amen. So chapters 1 through 8B, what Mark is attempting to do here is, is show you who who Jesus is. Okay? Then, through 8, I think it's 8 verse 27, through chapter 10, you have this pivot that happens. And the Mount of Transfiguration is here, if you're familiar with that. And so now you're seeing Jesus begin to pivot. And what's cool about this is this entire section right here happens in Galilee. Then this is a journey. And then this entire section, which is, if this is about who Jesus is, this is how he becomes who he is. I'm just going to put how he is Jesus. Which was unexpected, right? We talked about that. He goes to a cross. He doesn't go to a throne. The, the cross, him being high and lifted up is not him being lifted up on the throne. It's him being lifted up on the cross, right? And this happens all in Jerusalem. So you see the framework of the book, okay? Oh, and that's uh, 10 to the end. Say that. Okay? All right, so this is the framework. So chapter 12, what we just read, is in this portion where uh, it's all about how Jesus becomes who he is. And it's all the last days of Jesus' life, the passion Okay, and this is really important because 
<laughs> Jesus is making, he's, all right, like, think about this. This is the last week of Jesus' life, this chapter 12, this teaching, and this is one of the things he teaches about. And, and Mark is putting it in here because he wants us to understand how Jesus becomes who he is. And it's not what you would expect. It's not through the scribes, the ones who were the teachers. They were the ones that, that these scribes, if you, if you look in here, in verse, verse 38, it says, beware of the scribes. It's like, no, that's not the statement that should be in the Bible. You get that, right? Like when you read that, you should be like, what, what, what? what? How was that? How was that the case? Because the scribes were the guys, they were the guys that you went to for everything. Like when you had a problem, you go to the scribes. Hey, I have this problem. Help me understand this. What does Yahweh say about this? How do I live? What do I do? I've done this thing. I need, re I need to repent. I need to give a sacrifice. You go to the scribes. You go to these guys. And yet Jesus stands here and he's like, beware of those guys. Should, should take, you should take a step back when you read that. So Jesus is showing how he becomes Jesus. like it's not through what you would expect. It's not through that. So let's, let's look at this, what's happening here in this scene. So in this scene, they're in Jerusalem. Like this is Passover time, okay? So you're talking. Some even estimate, even up to like a million people, crowding in, okay? So at least we can say hundreds of thousands of people are crowded in Jerusalem. They're entering in and out of the temple, okay? And, and so now I'm going to go back to some teaching. Go to the next slide because I want to show you this, okay? Okay, so this is uh, Herod's temple. So this is the best framework of what, what we see. This is where all of this, a lot of this temple stuff would have taken place. So if you see the big court on the outside where it says court of the Gentiles, if you can see it. So there's this outside section, but you, then you have that like rectangle where there's stairs going up to it. That court of the Gentiles, that you, you what in your mind, what you should be thinking about, Jesus flipping over tables, because that's where that was at. Okay, when Jesus rolls in, it's court of the Gentiles, he's flipping over tables. Okay? So that's where that took place. Now, if you see in the front of the temple here, and you go up those front steps, you have this little section right there. So go to the next slide. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this is that this is that center section. And you see the women's courtyard right there. Okay, and then you have the chamber of leopards, the chamber of wood, uh, and, and, and the other things. Okay, so this is where this takes place in this uh, court of the women. And what would happen was, just imagine in there, what is there is all around the exterior where those four little areas are, the chamber for the leopards and the wood, is there were 13 shofars or big jugs. And they were called shofars because they had, they had like a trumpet shaped mouth. Of these jars, okay, and this is where you would come and you would give your money in the court of the uh, the women's courtyard. This is where you would come and you would you would give your offerings of, of money and of wood and of birds and all kinds. And there was thirteen of these structured around, okay. And it's not very big. It's not very big. I mean, it's, it's decently big, but it's not it's not tiny. But it, it but if you're in there and these shofars, so think about it. It's like a trumpet one, okay. So when you come by and you got all this money and you're dropping it in, right? The more money you drop in, the louder it sounds. It's like a horn goes off. It's like a horn goes off. So Jesus is in this place and he's got his disciples by. And just picture it. You got hundreds of thousands of people every day coming in through here and dropping their offerings into these containers and you can just hear the sound of money. Just now, whose eyes, I'm sorry, who would your eyes be drawn to? The more money, the louder it is. And then, check this out. So seven of these, seven of these uh, jars where you would put money, they were for like uh, very specific things. Like if everybody had to come there and do these specific things. And then there were these six, and that was all for the excess. That was all people who were giving what we would call maybe an offering above and beyond what was what was the normal. So where would your where would your eyes be drawn to? Oh, look how much they're giving above and beyond, and that's where these scribes would be dropping in massive amounts of money, and you would hear the money clink 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 clink, clink just dropping in there, just the sound of it. And Jesus says they wore their long robes and. They, drop their money in there as loud as they possibly could so that the sound would reverberate and everyone's eyes would be on them. The 
that Jesus had eyes to see and ears to hear. He wasn't looking at the flamboyant expression by the scribes, but he was looking for what the true kingdom looked like. He saw over there where the poor people would go. A little bit, just meeting the, the, the least required. And Jesus had the ability to hear those two coins above all the other coins. Jesus had the eyes to see a poor woman who was who was in raggedy clothes instead of seeing all the wrong robes of the scribes. And he says, Dad, disciples, come here. Come here, come here, come here. I know everybody's focused over here right now. But my kingdom's like this over here. Look, look. And what does he say? He says, she put in more than all the rest. Now, is that a true statement? Well, in one sense, yes, and in another sense, no, right? Yeah, these scribes were dumping in massive amounts that hurt uh, two little coins, which were uh, uh, leptons, I think is the proper term. Uh, they're, they're 1 64th of a denar denarius. So she put in two. A denarius is one day's wage. So she's 2 64th. I know that's not, you know, Whatever you do with fractions, because that's, I you know you can like minimize that down. Whatever, like one thirty second. Yeah, there we go. One thirty second of a day's wage. I don't do math in public. I don't do <laughs> Theology, apologetics, and stuff. All right. One thirty second, so y'all have said, of a day's wage. And she put more in. He says, that's what the kingdom is like. Isn't that different? Isn't that different? Isn't that. Unexpected, Like that's different than anything else. Like see, it says that they would go out and they would want greetings. You ever been around those people who they don't have to go shopping? People just solicit them to buy their stuff. They got that much money. It's like you can see it. You know, they got so much money. It's like they don't have to. Like people just come out and say, hey, I got this thing, this thing, this thing. I'm, you know, and people know that they, they, they have access. And this is one of the things, man, that we have to understand in our society. Like we're the scribes. We are in the top 1% of the world. Top 1% of the world. So if we're listening to this, like we have to put our feet and shoes inside the scribes and say, man, this is, this is probably most likely where we would fall if we're honest with ourselves. And that's really, that's really hard because we can look around at other people who are way better off than us. We're like, yeah, but so-and-so, but so-and-so, but so-and-so, but... So -and -so, but but let's get a let's get a biblical world view. Because it's not just about where we live. We serve the international harvester who's reaping harvest all over the world. So we need a world view. We need a biblical one at that. So this would be us. This would be us. Jesus says, listen, 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 listen. It's not about all that. Want the best seats and the honorable seats, and it's all for show. It's all for show. It's all for Facebook. It's all for Instagram. It's all for likes. It's all for. We we'll just keep piling on. It's all for this image. It's the show. And Jesus says, "Listen, it's motive that matters. It's the motive behind what you give, and then that that it can be the most minute thing, but." I will multiply that because the motive is mine. It's not the scribes who become the story that we have been telling for the last 2,000 plus years. This <laughs> one thirty second of a day's wage is what this woman dropped in this bucket. And we've been telling her story for 2,000 years. You think that's that's magnifying rather than my name, isn't it? Come on, who do you want to be? Like who, which, which one in the story do you want to be? Jesus is contrasting to for an intention that we would look at them and say, okay, now let's make a choice. Who are we going to be? Are we going to be the scribe or the poor widow? 
Where is our heart in a lie? That's the question we must ask ourselves. Do we have eyes to see and ears to hear like Jesus? Because he is the one who will take even the most minute little bit and he will multiply it through the ages. He will make it magnificent. I've been thinking about this. Eleanor loves to, uh, she loves to go around with this thing. Her papa got it for her. And, uh, and so she goes around and she's, she plays spy all the time. And she's got this magnifying glass. It's really fancy, actually. I don't know what this is. I don't know. I don't know. But it's, she's clearly, like, put her mouth on her toes. It's <laughs> disgusting. But, uh, but it's this magnifying glass. And some things happen when, because Jesus magnifies the minute. He makes magnificent the small things, just like this poor widow. He was able to, he was able to step in here and focus. Yeah, here, 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 here go. This is what a magnifying does. It, it brings increase to something, right? Like when you when you put this over this text, it gets bigger. Now it doesn't actually change this. It was still one thirty second of a day's wage. There we go. One thirty second of a day's wage. But yet, Jesus had eyes to magnify something. He's got ears to magnify something. Boom, it makes it bigger. It's bigger than me. I don't know if you can see it. You can imagine it, right? You can imagine it. Side note, this has nothing to do with the message. This is just a, a principle for reading the Bible properly. When you read parables and you're like, I don't get this, it's to engage your imagination. The whole point is for you to think and imagine what Jesus is talking about, and the more you do that, you act, actually then you begin to interact with the Word, who is a person, not just words on the page. Then interacting with a person is relation. That's called relationship. Now you're in relationship with Jesus. Anyway, that's a whole other message. But that's good. So write that down. It magnifies. It increases. Right? It makes something bigger than it actually is. That's one thing. Eleanor goes around. And she makes things bigger. Now it also helps you focus in on something very small. Right? Brings focus. Brings focus. You focus in on something, and you can begin to you can begin to focus in and see something that other people are missing with their regular eyes. Yeah, that's true about a magnifying glass. Yeah. The other thing it brings clarity to things too, doesn't it? Get in there, and it makes it bigger. It increases it, and then you're able to focus in on something that other people can't really focus in on, and then you begin to get clarity about that thing. You begin to see it for what it really, what it really is, what it truly is. Doesn't Jesus say something in there? Truly, I tell you, he said, focus, get some clarity about what the kingdom of heaven is really like. Now let me be very clear. What I'm not, what I'm not telling you is because he says about this woman, he says this, this poor woman, she gave everything she had. She gave everything she had. This is not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling every one of you to come up here and lay everything you have right here. What I'm telling you to do is lay everything you have at the feet of Jesus and allow him to tell you where to put it. I think I'm going to say that again. What I'm telling you is what the Bible says. And it says this. Everything you have, give it to Jesus and then allow him to dictate where it goes. And you may say, yeah, but I ain't got a lot. There's a lot of people out there who's got more than me. They got long roads and people greet them. You ain't worried about that. You ain't worried about a heart. The kingdom of heaven is like a person who has a proper heart in their giving and he will magnify that. He will make it increase. He will bring focus to it. He will direct it to the proper place that it needs to go. And then he'll bring clarity about that. He'll bring clarity in that. Like, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you? Well, one thing that I would say, here's a couple, here's a couple things. God's ruler forgives. God's measuring stick forgives. For what you give is sacrifice. It's not the amount. 
Some authors would say that it's about which it's about how much you have left over, not how much you give. In the kingdom of heaven, listen to this: the gift that counts is the gift that costs. Everybody, put your feet out, because that stepped on my toes, right? The gift that counts in the kingdom of heaven is the gift that costs. That's hard to swallow. And this is the thing. No gift of love is too small or insignificant. For Jesus takes the insignificant and makes it magnificent. He magnifies it. So practically, what does this mean? How does Jesus make magnificent the minute? How does he do that? Well, we saw one story where we're still telling that story. Right? And, and in a message a couple months ago, I preached this and I said, you know, when you risk it all for Jesus, it's not a risk at all. We talked about Rahab. And said, two things will always happen. This is a promise that God, God gives us. It's a promise, with no doubt, 100%. Two things. When you give this way, a gift that costs, God will deepen your relationship with Him and He will use your story as a catalyst for others. Every time. Every time, every time, every time, every time, take it to the back. So that's one thing. But like a magnifying glass, he increases. Let me let's put it this way. It said that the widow put in more. I've kind of explained that already. Now, let me, let me just give you some context here, okay? You go to Honduras or Kenya with, with uh, uh, Tanya and Keith. Like one meal. Like, check this out. One meal here in America. You cannot go out to eat with your family. One time, take that money, send it to Kenya or Honduras, and you're going to pay for a kid's school for an entire month, their meals for an entire month, and a uniform. That's increasing something, isn't it? Like, <laughs> try to do the same in America with that amount of money. So God's real good at things like this. Making increase. So this is why we're partnering with him all over the world, not just here. I said the second thing that it does is it brings things into focus. So it's not just for others, it's for you. When you begin to see Jesus, he had eyes to see and ears to hear. And what he did was he focused on the widow in that moment. And what he's communicating to everybody is something about himself which is what his purpose and passion is. It's about the hearts of men. So when you do the same thing, when you begin to give, you begin to give, what God will do is he'll begin to reveal your passions and purposes. What, what really lights you on fire, the areas, he'll bring the focus, he'll focus you in on a specific area. And he'll begin to realize that, man, God gifted you, gave you passions, and gave you purpose in this specific area. And then the third thing happens. Clarity. Clarity, right? You begin to see, see it in a way that nobody else sees it. This looks like this. It brings clarity this way. You'll learn more about that thing. Let's I'll, I'll read one more passage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. I'm sure you've all heard it before, but I'm going to go read it. I want you to listen to what it says. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, there is where your heart will be. Will be. Will be. So he says, where you put your money to, then that's where your heart follows. Where you put your treasure to, where you put your time, the things that you value the most, time, talents, treasures, that's the things you value the most. Where you put those things to, where you put that energy to, that's where your heart's going to be. So, in reverse, what can we do? We can look at our banking statement and we can see where our heart is. See where our heart is. So as we start to give, even if it's just a minute, even if it's 132nd, what begins to happen is our heart begins to be molded and shaped, our passions and purpose. We become invested in that thing. And this is what I know about investing. When you invest in something, you learn about it. You learn about it. You get more clarity about what you're investing in. 
You, you figure out that it's a, it's a passion and a purpose that God's given you, so you learn more about it. And then this is what happens. You invest more strategically, don't you? Once you learn more about it, you're like, okay, okay, now this is a specific area. This is how I can invest. This is how I can invest. You know what God does when you start investing strategically in something? He just, he, he just going to keep bringing in opportunities. I know there's two people sitting right there who's just with go. More opportunities than you want sometimes. But you begin to invest in truth. You begin to get more clarity. And then you organize with scalability in mind, right? For growth. You organize with growth. It's like you begin to think, okay, how can I do more? And how can I make a decision now that will benefit five years from now in ways that I can't even imagine? My new things. How can I make small decisions now that will be magnificent in five years? That's what the kingdom of God is like. That's the type of people that Jesus is trying to cultivate and create in his kingdom. And he promises that his spirit is in us. When we walk with him, Jesus walks with us and he manifests this type of living in our lives. So let me ask you this question. Is this the type of living that is manifested in your life? If not, where's Jesus? Is he not doing his job? I guess that's a rhetorical question. I think we all know the answer is. So my question to us church is, are we going to be a church that's found partnering with Jesus? Manifesting the way of Jesus. Are we going to walk the way of Jesus? To include what's in our back pocket or in our pocketbook or whatever you carry your money in or just in the bank. Is that going to be a part of it? And you may say to yourself, well, I don't have a whole lot. I only have a little bit. To okay. Awesome. Jesus is not worried about the amount. He's worried about the heart and the motive. And when you begin to give, listen, I promise you, he'll blow your mind. He'll do things through you that you never could have thought or imagined. He'll take you places that you never thought you would go. It's, it's not about me, but I mean, I'm just a country boy who grew up in Morristown of all places. And God's given me the opportunity to preach the gospel on the Amazon to Amazonian tribes. I've got to hike through Kenya with Keith and share the gospel with people who, if they've ever seen a white person before, it's like once, maybe on a video. We have to go and share with believers in a country where it was the, at the time it was the third most hostile country in the world for, for to be a Christian. All I got is like 30, one 32nd of a day's wages, man. I don't have a lot to give. But yet God just takes it, he just makes it magnificent and does things. But I'm just, you just, I don't, I don't know. I started out and I went to Kenya one time. It's been 12 years and now we started this many schools and we've Influence this many children and we've shared the gospel with this many people and this many people have come to know Jesus, I'm just a dentist. From, where are you from, Keith? Kentucky? Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky. Come on now. I think a man from Eastern Kentucky just want to be a dentist. And now he's invested with Mossad. Man, they call this guy a Mossad when you go over there. But look at him. If you know anything about the Mossad, he don't look Mossad. <laughs> You give it all to him. He'll take whatever all it is, no matter how small or how big. He'll make it magnificent. So let's do that, church. So we're going to do that with Keith and Tanya. We're going to do that with CRM and the country that they're in right now. 
They do that in Honduras at Destino del Reno. Tell you about that if you want to know more information about it. We're going to invest. Invest. We're going to be found partnering financially with the International Harvest Foods, who's reaping the harvest all over, all over the world. And that's, that's a good mission, isn't it? That's a good thing to be a part of. So let's be a part of the church. So application, we're still taking up our international harvester. That's what this money is going to. We're just going to hand it to these people. This 2020 has been crazy for them too. They, many of them can't go. They, they can't go out to meet people and those things that they normally do. So what they need is they need money to support the people who are on the ground doing the mundane things as we talk about. Those everyday things, the grind. So we're going to partner with them. So I'd ask you to give in that manner. Whatever God. Blank check to Jesus, not to hear. Blank checks to Jesus and let him fill in the blank. Whatever he says. Whatever he says. Give it all to him. He'll direct it. He'll direct it where it needs to go. He's a much better director of finances than all of us put together. Give to him. Let him direct it, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you that, uh, and even though we don't have a lot to give, that you'll take it. You'll do magnificent things out of it. You'll take what's minute, seeming to the eye and to the ear. But for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, you make magnificent things out of that. And Lord, we, that's what we, we long for. We want to make an impact, Lord. We don't want to impress people for show. We want to make an impact on lives of people all across this world. Because you are worthy. You are good. And you're at work even today. And we want to partner with you. We want to walk away, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.